We're here at Beth Shurim. It simply means House of Gates. In the second century AD, when the Jewish leaders were buried, they were buried here in the catacombs. After the burial, the gates were put across, so there we have it. Bet meaning house and Shurim meaning gates. Well, maybe you didn't even know that there were catacombs in Israel, did you? They're interesting, aren't they? In fact, there's a lot of very interesting burial customs. So many people have different ideas about burial. For instance, in India, the Hindus cremate their dead, put them on a funeral pyre, and then light the fire and burn the body completely. The Tibetans have rather a gruesome method of disposing of the dead, very practical, really because, uh, you know, up there in Tibet on the roof of the world, uh, it's very stony, very hard ground, and who wants to dig a grave in a place like that? And so what they do is they have special men appointed who will cut the body into pieces, and then they throw them to the birds. In fact, uh, that is what the Parsis do. You know the Parsis who originally came from Persia, driven out by the Muslim invasion, and uh, they worship fire and water and... Uh, earth, uh, the elements, they don't like to desecrate these things. And so they have a system whereby they have a big round tower, they call it a tower of silence. And then they place the naked body inside this tower on an iron grating. And of course the vultures come down and in about 10 minutes all that's left is the bones, that's all. Of course the Muslims believe in burial and a form of resurrection. And so there are some very magnificent Muslim uh, burial places. For instance, you're all familiar with the Taj Mahal, where Shah Jahan buried his beautiful wife, Mumtaz Mahal, many years ago. And that's a magnificent monument. And then, of course, the ancient Greeks believed in the preservation of the soul. So did the Egyptians. In fact, they had a very interesting custom. They had what they call is, uh, they called an ushabti. And it's a little figure about this big or sometimes smaller sometimes bigger and uh, this figure carried a flail and a sickle over his in his arms you see and the idea is put one of these in your burial place and this fellows will be animated in the life to come and he'll do all your farm work for you so different people had different customs different ideas about what happens when you die and of course Christians have their own ideas about this too. You go to a Christian cemetery and uh, there you'll read on the tombstones where so-and-so has gone to heaven. And uh, most Christians believe you either go to heaven or go to hell when you die, your soul leaves the body. Well, what's it all about anyway? What does happen when you die? Does the soul leave the body and go to heaven or wherever? Uh, the best answer that we can get, of course, is from the Bible, because after all, that's God's answer, and God ought to know what, what happens when you do die. 
So we need to consult the Bible to find out just what is involved in death. What happens? Where are you 10 minutes after you die? Well, I'll tell you one thing that you can get from the Bible. The very first message is this. You don't need to be afraid of dying. This is not actually the tomb of Jesus Christ. It's the tomb of Herod's family, but it's very like it. And you can imagine Jesus Christ stepping out of this tomb and coming back to life. He's been dead, really dead, and yet here he is, back to life again. Well, what would you like to ask him? I'm sure there's a lot of people who would like to ask him, Jesus, what's it like to die? What's this feel like to be dead? After all, here's somebody who's been through the experience. No use asking a preacher or asking somebody who hasn't been through the experience. Ask somebody who's been through it, and Jesus has. And he gives us the answer. Do you know what it is? It's found in Revelation chapter 1 and in verse 17, where he said, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. So the great message that Jesus Christ, who has been through the experience of death, the message he has for us is, don't be afraid. It's only asleep. Don't worry about it. And why don't we need to worry? Because he says, I have the keys of Hades and of death, that is, of the grave and death. He's got the keys. He can open the door. He can let you out. So nobody needs to be afraid of dying when you know that Jesus Christ has been through it and he says, don't be afraid, and he's got the keys to let you out again. At the moment, we are visiting the Church of Lazarus. Actually, the tomb of Lazarus is just up the lane a little bit. Well, I say the tomb of Lazarus, it's really not his tomb. In fact, it's not even a tomb. It's more likely to be a water cistern. But anyway, it reminds us of the story of Lazarus, and it's a very dramatic story. Jesus Christ was down the other side of the River Jordan when the message came to him that his friend Lazarus was sick. He waited another four days and then he said to his disciples, our friend Lazarus sleeps but I go that I may wake him. Well his disciples said if he's sleeping that's a good thing. But Jesus said in John 11 verse 14, Lazarus is dead. I want you to notice that he referred to death as a sleep and really that's what death is, just like going to sleep. That's why you don't need to be afraid of dying. You know, when you see a little baby lying in its cot, you don't get all excited and say, hey, this baby isn't, isn't doing anything. No, it's sleeping. And you know that it's going to awaken out of its sleep. And so when people die, they don't need to be afraid of dying because it's just asleep and you're going to awaken out of that sleep. In fact, in Psalms 17 and in verse 15, the writer said, as for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. So David was quite satisfied to go to sleep in death and then just awaken out of that death. And so nobody needs to be afraid of dying. But what about the soul in the meantime? What happens to that? Let me read to you the Bible definition of a soul. I'm reading in Genesis chapter 2 and in verse 7 where there's the record of the creation of man. It says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, that has made his body, and breathed into his, to, into his nostrils the breath of life. Breath of life and spirit are equal terms in the biblical record. And man became a living being or a living soul. Same thing. Now let me illustrate it on the board. God, first of all, made man's body. And then he breathed into his nostrils the spirit or breath of life. And man became a living soul. All right. Now, when a man dies, what happens? Just the opposite. In Psalms 146 and in verses 3 and 4, it says, do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. His spirit departs. He returns to his earth. In that very day, 
his thoughts perish. All right, do you see what has happened then when a man dies? His, he was a living soul, his spirit left, and all that was left was the body. And you know the old funeral prescription, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, all that was left was the body. So, what was the result? Well, we have here in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and in verse 5, for the living that they know that they will die, but the dead know not anything. How can you if it's just a dead body? Well, you might say, well, where did the soul go to? Surely it went somewhere. Not necessarily. Let me illustrate it this way. Now, we have a light in this room and it's got a glass bulb and a metal filament and it's got electricity flowing through it and so we have light. But now, let me just reach over and flick the switch off. All right. Now, the light's gone off. Where did it go? Did it go out the window or under the table or where did it go? Well, it didn't go anywhere. We simply turned it off. Now, that's the way it is with the living soul, the human being. It's alive. It's got all the elements, the material elements, but God switches it off. And so, life ceases to exist. And all you have left is the human body. Now, this comes as a bit of a surprise to some people and they raise the question, but listen, doesn't the Bible teach that the soul is immortal, that it cannot die? No, that's not what the Bible teaches. Listen, I'm reading in Ezekiel chapter 18 and in verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine. The souls of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. Listen, the soul who sins shall die. That's plain enough, isn't it? The soul that sins shall die. So, the soul can die. But at the resurrection, again we get back to the creation formula. In other words, body plus spirit or breath of life equals a living soul again. This is the Valley of Gehenna. This is where all the rubbish from Jerusalem was dumped. They brought it out of the dung gate over there and dumped it into the valley here. And of course the maggots got to work and the fires were smouldering all the time. Jesus Christ referred to this where he referred to the place where their worm dieth not and their fire is not quenched. Now this also is probably the valley of dry bones. Ever read about that in the book of Ezekiel? Interesting. Chapter 37, the hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley and it was full of bones. Apparently there had been some battle and a lot of people had got killed and their bodies were just dumped down here and the vultures had picked their flesh and so just a lot of dry bones were lying around. And so God said to Ezekiel, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. <laughs> Fancy bones hearing the word of the Lord, but you see, bones can listen if God speaks. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. All the bones gathered together, and they were all fitted up as nice skeletons. But then that wasn't the end. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. Now, here they were, beautifully made bodies, remade, and they looked all right, but they were still dead. There was no breath in them. All right, what comes next? Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Now, can you see the process? Creation was the body plus the breath of life, and it became a living soul. At death, the living person died, the breath of life left, and only the body was left. Now again, you've got the reversal of this process, you see. And so here is a picture of the resurrection. Now some people might say, well, that's all very well, but what if there are no bones left? Supposing a fellow's been eaten by a tiger or he's been burned in a fire, there's just no bones left. You don't need to worry about that. You see, God is not dependent upon the original atoms from which we are made. He can use other atoms and remake us just exactly as we were originally. Job voiced this thought in chapter 19, verse 25. He says, I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at, at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. 
It doesn't matter if your body's destroyed. God can remake it just the same. And so the hope of people in this world is the future immortal life as a result of the resurrection. Paul describes this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and in verse 16 where he says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. What a great day that will be. But listen, I just want to tell you something. There's going to be two resurrections. Did you know that? Well, you've got to accept it because that's what Jesus Christ said in John chapter 5 and in verse 28. He said, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves will hear his voice. It doesn't matter whether you believe it or not, whether you're ready or not, you're going to hear that voice. And then he says, they shall come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. That's terribly important. You come up in the right resurrection, isn't it? I'm sure we all want to be in the right resurrection. Sometimes people get involved in spiritualism and they're quite certain they've seen a soul or a spirit. Others believe it's all an illusion, and maybe there is illusion and trickery practiced. But things do happen, and sometimes some quite frightening things. We'll be coming to grips with this issue in our next program when we visit Endor, where the first recorded spiritualist seance in history took place. <laughs> 